This audio is brought to you by Muslim Central. Please consider donating to help cover our running costs and future projects by visiting www.muslimcentral.com forward slash donate. You're listening to Kalam Institute's podcast series, Sira, Life of the Prophet, by Sheikh Abdul Nasir Jangda. Visit us on the web at kalaminstitute.org or find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Kalam Institute. Bismillah wa alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. Inshallah continuing with our series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Asiratu Nabawiyah, the prophetic biography. In the previous session, we talked about the Prophet Wasallam's arrival in al Madinatul Munawwara and how exactly the Prophet Wasallam was able to decide, or rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed not just the Prophet Wasallam, but the camel, the she-camel that the Prophet Wasallam was riding on exactly where to stop and then the Prophet Wasallam accordingly designated the place where the masjid would be constructed, Al-Masjid Nabawi Al-Sharif, the prophetic mosque, the Prophet Wasallam's masjid, but also the Prophet Wasallam took up residence there at the nearest home, and that was the home, Daru, Abu Ayyub, Daru Abi Ayyub Al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the home of Abu Ayyub Al-Ansari, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with him. And we talked a little bit about some of the stories about Abu Ayyub al-Ansari's hospitality towards the Prophet Wasallam. And if you will, what I called last week, um, some of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu's stories, personal stories about having the Prophet Wasallam living in his own home. Uh, I wanted to kind of go back and just fill in some of the blanks and some of the details um, because some of, I, I wanted to keep the topics kind of consistent and focus in on each exact event. The Prophet Wasallam's arrival in Quba, his departure from Quba, his arrival in Medina. But I just wanted to fill in some of the gaps and, and touch on some things that we weren't able to get, uh, get to in the previous couple of sessions. First of all, we talked about how the Prophet Wasallam first stayed at the place of Quba. And of course, one of the things I mentioned at that time was, the first masjid ever constructed in the history of this ummah, was the Masjid of Quba, at the place of Quba. This is the suburb of Medina. And we talked about how the Prophet ﷺ stayed there about 12 days. And during that time, they constructed a small humble masjid. And that was the first masjid to ever be constructed by this ummah, in the history of this ummah. I wanted to talk about that just a little bit. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and there is some difference of opinion. There are the ayat in Surah Tawbah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَمَسْجِدٌ أُسِّسَ عَلَى التَّقْوَى مِنْ أَوَّلِ يَوْمٍ أَحَقُّ أَن تَقُومَ فِيهِ That a masjid that was constructed upon the foundation of taqwa, God consciousness, is a lot more deserving that you, O Messenger of Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah, it's a lot more deserving of you standing therein and praying in that masjid. There's a little bit of a difference of opinion between the scholars, whether this ayah is referring to the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, this is talking about Al-Masjid Nabawi, or maybe this is also talking about the Masjid of Quba. And so either way, it could be talking about both equally. But the fact of the matter is that this is also related to the Masjid of Quba. And so the Masjid of Quba was praised, and so the narration tells us in Sahih Muslim, uh, or, or rather, excuse me, um, the narration of Sahih Muslim says that this is uh, the Masjid of Nabawi, Masjid Nabawi, the Prophet ﷺ's mosque is talking about. But there are other narrations, such as the narration of Imam Ahmad in his Musnad, that say that this was the Masjid of Quba that he was talking about. And the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, he says to the people of Quba, "In Allah qad ahsana alaykum al-thana fi al-tahur fi qissati masjidikum, fama hada al-tahur al-ladhi tatahharun bihi." So Allah goes on to say in the ayah of Surah Tawbah, ayah number 108, that this masjid is more deserving of your presence. Why? Fihi rijalun. In this masjid, meaning in this community, there are people, there are individuals. Yuhibbuna an yatataharu. Who very much love to purify themselves. They love to purify themselves. 
And so the scholars of tafsir explain that this is a this has a general meaning. Allah did not restrict the meaning of it. So it means internal and external purity. But there is this narration from the Musnad of Imam Ahmad that the Prophet ﷺ asked them that God has praised you, Allah has praised you in the Quran because he says that you love to purify yourself. Explain to me, inform me, what is this practice of purification, cleanliness? What ritual of cleanliness do you practice due to which Allah would praise you? قَالُوا وَاللَّهِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا مَا شَيْئًا They said, O oh, Messenger of God, O oh, Messenger of Allah, we don't know anything special like that. But they said, إِلَّا أَنَّهُ كَانَ لَنَا جِيرَانُ مِنَ الْيَهُودِ we are neighbors with some of the Jewish tribes. فَكَانُوا يَغْسِلُونَ أَدْبَارَهُمْ مِنَ الْغَائِطِ And when they would go to the restroom, see in the, at the time of the Arab, especially in the habit of the Arab, and more so even the Bedouins, they had a habit where they would use, like consider it the equivalent of toilet paper. So they would, after they would use the restroom, uh, they would clean themselves, dry themselves, cleanse themselves using toilet paper without regularly using water. And there's a lot of discussion like how is that possible, you know, especially if it's creating a mess and other things. So even they didn't use toilets the way that we do, where there was a lot more mess that was created, there was a lot more urine, you know, that would spread around one, on one's body where you have to wash yourself. Secondly, even if we're talking about ghaid, right, relieving yourself. Uh, number two, what they call. So even when you talk about that, there's a different dynamic in terms of the diet and the lifestyle that they lived to where they were able to actually clean themselves, cleanse themselves very properly without having to use water all the time. And so they were in the habit of this. This was the habit of the Arab. And this is even Islamically permissible if someone can actually manage to clean themselves properly. And they would use like these little, uh, not quite rocks, but like these little dirt stones, um, dried sand. They would use things like that to be able to cleanse themselves properly. And they were able to do so. So water wasn't necessary to be used, even though in our case, in our situation these days, water has pretty much become a necessity. But that has a lot of different factors involved with it. But So at that time, when water wasn't always necessary, these people of Quba, the Muslims of Quba, they tell the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, we have these neighbors from the Jewish tribes. They have a habit. We saw when they go to the restroom, they use water to actually wash themselves. So after drying themselves and cleansing themselves, then they use water to wash themselves off. To just be absolutely, without a doubt, in a state of cleanliness and purification. That there's no filth remaining whatsoever. So this is what they do. So we saw this, فَغَسَلْنَا كَمَا غَسَلُوا And we started practicing the same thing. Because we figured, you know, it's good. And so the Prophet ﷺ tells them, congratulates them, and he says that this is exactly why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has praised you. Another narration of Imam Abu Dawood, in the Sunan of Abu Dawood, in the Jami' of Imam Tirmidhi, in the Sunan of Ibn Majah. So there are plenty of narrations. The hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala who says that the Messenger of Allah ﷺ said, نَزَلَتْ هَذِي الْآيَةَ فِي أَهْلِ قُبَى that this verse, this ayah was revealed about the people of Quba. فِيهِ رِجَالٌ يُحِبُّونَ أَن يَتَطَهَرُوا وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُطَهِرِينَ That in this city of Quba, in this community, there are people who love to purify themselves internally and externally. And a lot of times we don't make the connection, but the two are very intimately connected. There's a deep, profound spiritual connection between the outwardly cleanliness and then the internal purification. You can't have one without the other. Otherwise, your, 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 your purification, your cleanliness is not uh, complete in that sense. So he goes on to say, قَالَ كَانُوا يَسْتَنْجُونَ بِالْمَا They use water to cleanse themselves. So they properly, when they use the restroom, they're not just always in a rush, in a hurry. They make sure that they use the restroom properly, and then they cleanse themselves properly. Right? The Prophet ﷺ said, لَا صَلَاةَ إِلَّا بِطُهُورٍ There is no prayer without proper purification. So you have to understand it from the Islamic perspective that you can't even have worship if you don't cleanse yourself properly. 
And so it's really a serious issue. And, and this is the kind of thing that we oftentimes smirk about or seems kind of silly to talk about. And I, I will say one thing. I'll just kind of go out, go out on the ledge and say one thing here. That a lot of times older folks, especially um, a lot of the community, like the immigrant community, that might have come from majority Muslim communities and majority Muslim countries, a lot of times it's, in, it's ingrained within the culture. It's a part of the culture, it's a part of growing up, you know this naturally. And so we take it for granted. And you'd be shocked and surprised as to how many of our children, our youth are not familiar with these things. And this is essential Islamic education. Now what's usually immediately the response to that? We need to have a masjid program in the masjid for the youth, teach them how to do istinja. <laughs> that's not the imam's job, that's the parent's job. Alright, so make sure that you impart the understanding of tahara, cleanliness to your children as a part of their faith, as a part of their spirituality. Make sure that you do that, it's very very important. And for adults, also just because you kind of grew up in a culture where generally there's just a lota in every bathroom, there's a water jug in every single bathroom, so automatically, you know, water jug equals tahara, not, not, not necessarily. Learn the fiqh of tahara, you'd actually be shocked if, if, if even the adults in the Muslim community, if they were to sit down in a lesson of the fiqh of tahara, the, the Islamic rulings in regards to cleanliness and purification, you'd actually be shocked. I've had, in these types of lessons and classes, I've had grown people, who are mashallah mutadayinun, practicing grown people who come from these types of cultures or families where generally you have a general idea of what is istinja, what is tahara and these things. And when they go through the fiqh of tahara, they come off to me over to the side and they said, I just realized I've been najis my entire life. My entire adult life, I've been in a state of impurity. And so that's how serious this issue. I don't mean to create paranoia, that's not my objective. But it's, it's something we have to take seriously. We're too easy going and too flippant with these things because we just figure like we're enlightened. Right? We, 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 we're, we're a little too sometimes, a little too confident about who we are and where we're at. So sometimes we're just, we just assume we're just enlightened people. Um, but it's important to always be learning. And this stuff is the absolute basis and fundamentals. That's why every great scholar of our deen and our religion, all the fuqaha, all the scholars of fiqh, start their masterpieces. These are masterpieces. At the seminary, at the Qalam seminary, I've been, uh, we, covered the, we covered a book of fiqh that is over 1100 years old. I mean, that's a masterpiece. If somebody can, you know, forget about Harry Potter and things like this, a hundred years from now, is somebody even gonna read this dribble? That's the question. Right? Think about writing a book that survives 1100 years, 11 centuries. That's remarkable. And what does he start his book with? Kitab al-Tahara. Kitab al-Tahara. Right? He starts his masterpiece that survives 11 centuries with purification. Because we can't talk about prayer, we can't talk about fasting, we can't talk about zakat, we can't talk about hajj, unless you first know how to be in a state of purification and cleanliness. Very important. All the major works of hadith, muhaddithun, all the major works of hadith, have a very huge chapter, where it's just all the collection of all the prophetic traditions in regards to purification. In fact, what's also very fascinating is that a lot of some of, there, there are different formats of different books of hadith, that's a whole class in and of itself. But in the very traditional, like the sunan, the sunan format, which, rep, which is representative of, you know, a lot of the major works of hadith, in the sunan format, it, off, it, it will start again. With, it'll start with the issues of faith and iman and belief. And after that, it'll switch over to again tahara. That after being Muslim, next thing you need to know is tahara. How to cleanse yourself properly. How to be in a state of purification, ritual purification, spiritual purification. So it's a very important issue. And the Prophet ﷺ praised them in regards to this. And so going on, talking about the community in Quba, there's another narration that is mentioned in the books of uh, Hadith and Seerah 
that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa وَقَدْ كَانَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَزُورُهُ أَيَّ الْقُبَاءَ فِي مَا بَعْدُ وَيُصَلِّ فِيهِ Even after he moved into Medina and he moved into Medina, he would regularly visit back to the community of Quba and pay visits to the Masjid of Quba, the community of Quba, and the people of Quba. وَكَانَ يَأْتِي قُبَاءً كُلَّ سَبْتٍ Some narrations mention that every Saturday he would come and visit the people of Quba. Every Saturday, taratan rakiman wa taratan mashian. Sometimes he'd be, he'd come on transportation, like on a mule, on the donkey, or sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would come even walking. He would just set out walking from his home and pray with them. There's an authentic narration in, in Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah, um, where the Prophet of Allah ﷺ says, salatun fi masjid quba ka umrah. Praying salah in the masjid of quba is like performing umrah. وَقَدَ وَرَدَ فِي الْحَدِيثِ أَنَّ جِبْرِيلَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامِ هُوَ الَّذِي أَشَارَ لِلنَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِلَى مَوْضِعِ قِبْلَةِ مَسْجِدِ قُبَى That there are some narrations which even tell us that when they were constructing the Masjid of Quba, and the Prophet ﷺ was trying to figure out which way the Qibla would be in the Masjid of Quba, Jibreel ﷺ came to the Prophet ﷺ and pointed in the direction that this is the direction of the Qibla. It's a very blessed place. So this was the Masjid of Quba. So, and a couple of things that I wanted to mention in the previous sessions, quite some time ago, and you'll find it in the podcast, there's a story, there's a whole session that's devoted, dedicated to the acceptance of Islam and the whole spiritual journey of Salman al-Farisi radiallahu ta'ala anhu. When you go back and you listen to that story about Salman al-Farisi radiallahu anhu accepting Islam, you'll recall that it talks about how when the Prophet ﷺ arrived at Quba, Salman al-Farisi came to meet him and test you know, the different signs of nubuwa and prophethood that one of his previous teachers, the Christian monks, had informed him of uh, when it came to the Prophet of the last times. And so that was the Masjid of Quba. He visited the Prophet ﷺ first and foremost in the Masjid of Quba, and that story was uh, situated here, was based here. The next thing I wanted to talk about today was when the Prophet ﷺ, I've kind of alluded to this earlier, Abdullah bin Salam, Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu ta'ala anhu, was from the nobility of the Jewish tribes, and he was also a scholar of Jewish tradition, known basically as a Jewish rabbi. So he was a scholar and a nobleman when it came, from, when it came to the Jewish tribes. Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu ta'ala anhu, there's a little bit of, you know, uh, there's, some, there's two different narrations. Some of the narrations mention that he comes to visit the Prophet sallallahu in Quba. Some of the narrations say, no, he came to see the Prophet sallallahu after 12 days when the Prophet sallallahu came to, al madinatul Munawwara, when he came to the city of Medina itself. So that's why I'll mention it here. So in either scenario, whether this was in Quba, or it was as soon as he arrived in Medina, Abdullah bin Salam says that everybody was just flocking to see the Prophet So I decided to go ahead and go as well. I knew a lot of the scriptures, the prophecies, the traditions that would talk about this Prophet, Nabi wa Akhir zaman the Prophet of the last times. So I wanted to go test this out and see this for myself. And he says that, فَلَمَّا تَبَيَّنْتُ وَجْهَهُ When I was able to finally get close enough to see his face, عَرَفْتَ أَنَّهُ لَيْسَ بِوَجْهٍ كَذَّابٍ بِوَجْهِ كَذَّابٍ I recognized and realized this was not the face of a liar. فَكَانَ أَوَّلُ شَيْءٍ سَمِعَتُهُ يَقُولُ The first thing that I heard him say when I got within earshot, I was close enough to hear him talking, he was telling the people, أَفْشُ salam, Spread salam, spread peace. Whether that means to spread the greetings, or it literally means to spread peace, it means both at the same time. This is مِنْ جَوَامِعِ الْكَلِمْ This is the eloquence of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. He said, وَأَطْعِمُوا الطَّعَامَ and feed food to people, both the poor, and even if they're not poor, even socially, like familially, like socially, like sit and eat together, share food with people, give food to the poor and the needy, and create bonds of love and relationships amongst yourselves. وَصِلُوا arhama. And he said, join family relations, respect, revere family relationships. وَصَلُّوا بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامٌ and he said that pray in the night time while majority of humanity is asleep, تَدُخُلُوا الْجَنَّةَ بِسَلَامٍ And you will enter into paradise by virtue of these deeds, 
You will enter into paradise peacefully, unharmed, safe and sound. And this is narrated in the books of Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah and other books of Hadith. So he says, this is the first thing I heard him say. Now, it goes on to mention that he approaches the Prophet ﷺ and he says, O Messenger of Allah, uh, he, says, ya, he says, Ya Muhammad, I have three questions for you. I have three things I'd like to ask you. Inni sa'iluka an thalathin la ya'lamuhunna illa nabiyun. I need to ask you about three things and only a Prophet will know these three things. Number one, ma awalu ashrati sa'a. What is the first of the signs of the hour, day of judgment? Number two, وَمَا أَوَّلُ تُعَامٍ يَأْكُلُهُ أَهْلُ الْجَنَّةِ What is the first type of food that the people of paradise would eat, would consume? وَمَا يَنزِعُ الْوَلَدَ إِلَىٰ أَبِهِ أَوْ إِلَىٰ أُمِّهِ Why do some children resemble their father and some children resemble their mothers? So I, I have these three questions that only a Prophet would know. So the Prophet ﷺ begins to tell him, أَخْبَرَنِي بِهِنَّ جِبْرِيلُ آنِفًا the Prophet ﷺ tells him that Jibreel has just brought me the answer to these questions. And he says something very interesting, Abdullah bin Salam, the Jewish scholar. He says, Jibreel? Like question mark? Like kind of shocked, Jibreel? And the Prophet ﷺ says, Naam, Jibreel. So he says, Adul Yahudi min al malaika. The Jews call Jibreel their enemy. The Jews harbor a lot of hatred for Jibreel. And there's, there's a whole explanation within the books of tafsir why that is. We read that in the tafsir of the ayah, مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوًا لِجِبْرِيلَ فَإِنَّهُ نَزَّلَهُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ Right, so the ayat in Surah Al-Baqarah, قُلْ مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوًا لِجِبْرِيلَ فَإِنَّهُ نَزَّلَهُ عَلَىٰ قَلْبِكَ etc. etc. مَنْ كَانَ عَدُوًا لِلَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِي وَرُسُلِي وَجِبْرِيلَ وَمِيكَالِ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَدُوَ لِلْكَافِرِينَ Right, so it, it talks about this that there are multiple reasons why the Yahud had this type of resentment or animosity. One of the things that it mentions is that some of the previous nations that were destroyed or that were punished, that punishment, that destruction would oftentimes come at the hands of Jibreel alayhi salam. So they harbored a lot of hatred and animosity towards Jibreel alayhi salam. The other thing that it mentions is that because in their books, in their prophecy, in their scriptures, they knew that prophethood would come in the last time, at the end of times, to someone from the Arab, from Waladu Ismail. And because Jibreel would bring that revelation, that they developed this hatred and animosity to discredit Jibreel, so that whoever he would bring the message to would automatically be discredited. So there were all these very uh, problematic issues that they had. So nevertheless, he tells the Prophet ﷺ that you do know that the Yahud, they hate Jibreel alayhi salam. So the Prophet ﷺ, he recited the ayat of Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 97 and on forth. And then the Prophet ﷺ tells him, أَمَّا أَوَّلُ أَشْرَاتِ السَّاعَةِ As for the first of the signs of the day of the hour, the day, uh, the hour, the day of resurrection, فَنَارٌ تَخْرُجُ عَلَى النَّاسِ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ إِلَى الْمَغْرِبِ There will be a fire that will rage from the east and move westward. And it will start to push the people westward. This, this is the first of the signs. Then he tells him that as for the second question, what will be the first type of food that the people of paradise will eat? فَزِيَادَةُ كَبَتِ حُودٍ So he tells him that they will eat the liver of the fish. They will eat the liver of the fish. Um, what, and then thirdly he tells him that the reason why some children resemble their father versus some children from the same family, same household, same two parents, will resemble the mother, is because the Prophet ﷺ, the wording he used is that the, um, the, 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 the body or the, the, the elements of the father become dominant over the elements of the mother. Which of course the Prophet ﷺ here is making, he's alluding to what? Genetics. 1400 years ago. So he's alluding to genetics basically, that it depends on the elements of who become more prominent. Why? Because there was a lot of superstition amongst the Yahud and the Jews, that if a child is conceived on th in this month, then he'll resemble the father. And if he's conceived on that night, then he'll be re resembling the mother. If, and I, I don't mean to be too explicit, but the Yahud had a lot of these types of superstition, that if the child is conceived 
in this type of a physical posture, then he will resemble the father versus the mother, etc., etc. They had a bunch of this nonsense uh, in their rhetoric. So the Prophet ﷺ immediately dismissed all of that, and he said, all of that is nonsense, it's all garbage. But basically it depends on whose genetics basically become dominant over the other. And that of course is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when the Prophet ﷺ responds in this matter, Abdullah bin Salam says, Ashadu annaka Rasulullah. Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa annaka Rasulullah. That I testify that there is no one worthy of worship except for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that you, O Messenger, O, o Muhammad, are the Messenger and the Prophet of Allah. He then tells the Prophet ﷺ, I'd like to go and introduce you to my people. But he said, here's the problem. He says that the Yahud are very fickle people. They're very fickle, they're very um, quick to turn on you. And so he said that, I'd like for you to kind of see something. And they will say things about me, وَإِنَّهُمْ يَقُولُونَ فِيَّ مَا لَيْسَ بِي, مَا لَيْسَ بِي They will say things about me that, is not, that are not true. So here's what we're going to do. I will take you there, I will have somebody gather the whole tribe together. I will take you there, I'll be hiding. You can go ahead and address him, introduce yourself to them. And then I want you to ask them what they say about me. And then we'll take it from there. So the Prophet ﷺ, they gather everyone together, he sends some people to gather everyone together. The Prophet ﷺ comes out, he introduces himself to them. And then the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Ya ma'ashar al-Yahud, um, or no, excuse me. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam then asks them, that ayyu rajulin abdullahi fikum? Abdullah bin Salam, ayyu rajulin abdullahi fikum? What kind of a man is Abdullah from amongst you? So they respond by saying that Sayyiduna wa abnu Sayyidina. Sayyiduna wa abnu Sayyidina. He is a leader of ours and he is the son of our leader. خَيْرُنَا وَابْنُ خَيْرِنَا أَعْلَمُنَا وَابْنُ أَعْلَمِنَا He is the best amongst us and the son of the best of amongst us. He is the most knowledgeable amongst us and the son of the most knowledgeable amongst us. Then the Prophet of Allah وسلم asks Abdullah bin Salam to join him on stage. And the Prophet of Allah, and, and so the, when Abdullah bin Salam joins, them on, joins the Prophet ﷺ in front of all the people, the Prophet ﷺ asks the Jewish tribes, he says, Ya ma'ashar al-Yahud, ad'ukum ila Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa ad'ukum ila al-Islam, wa anni qad ji'tukum bihaqqin, that I call you to Allah, I call you to Islam, and the fact that I have come to you with the truth. And they, res they respond and reject the request of the Prophet ﷺ, and they say, ma na'lamuhu. Because the Prophet ﷺ says, أَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ بِأَنِّي قَدْ جِئْتُكُمْ بِحَقٍّ You know that what I've come to you is the truth. And they say, مَا نَعْلَمُهُ We don't know that. We don't know that. You're assuming that on our behalf. We don't know what you're saying is true or not. So then the Prophet ﷺ calls Abdullah bin Salam. Abdullah bin Salam comes out in front of everyone. And Abdullah bin Salam basically proclaims his iman and his Islam in front of everyone. And he says, أَشْهَدُ أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدَ الرَّسُولُ اللَّهِ and he testifies to his iman in front of all the people. And then the Prophet of Allah ﷺ now asks them, that, وَأَيُّ رَجُلٍ عَبْدُ اللَّهِ فِيكُمْ What kind of a man is Abdullah from amongst you? And they said, شَرُّنَا وَابْنُ شَرِّنَا He's the worst amongst us, and he's the son of the worst amongst us. He's a wretched, terrible man, terrible guy. We didn't expect anything else but this from him. And they basically dismiss him. And that was kind of the Prophet ﷺ's introduction to Abdullah bin Salam and some of the Jewish tribes at that particular time. Now as we were talking about before, the Prophet ﷺ arrives within Medina, he's resident in the home of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu. One interesting little detail that I left out, I talked about how, you know, every single day, 
you know, morning and evening, there were like people lined up at the door of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu for the Prophet ﷺ bringing him food. I forgot to mention what actually led to that. One of the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum, he actually says, I brought the Prophet ﷺ some food. As soon as he arrived, as soon as he landed there, and he went into the home of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I went home, I, you know, immediately put something together, a plate full of food, and I rushed over there, and I was the first one at the door. I knocked at the door, the Prophet ﷺ answered the door, and I presented the food to the Prophet ﷺ, that Ya Rasulullah, this is for you. And he said, the Prophet ﷺ took it from me, he received it from me, and he said to me, Barakallahu feek. Barakallahu feek. Right? As we say, Jazakumullah khairun, Barakallahu feekum. Right? He said, Barakallahu feek. May Allah put blessing not just in you, but like in your life. May Allah shower His blessings upon you. And he said, he just said that, you know, again, Barakallahu Feek. And of course the Prophet ﷺ meant it. He didn't just say it as a formality, but he said, Barakallahu Feek. And he said, when I heard those words, it was like, that's it. I'm set. I'm gonna go start a new business, right? I'm gonna go do this, I'm gonna go, you know, I, I'm, I'm good. Barakallahu Feek, like the Prophet ﷺ I'm saying, Barakallahu Feek. Making dua for Barakah and blessing in my life, I was done. So I left there telling everybody, guess what I got today? Right? Guess who the Prophet ﷺ said Barakallahu Feek to? This guy. Right? And I just went around bragging everywhere. The Prophet ﷺ said Barakallahu Feek to me. He made dua for Barakah for me. Right here, I'm the guy. Right? I just went around bragging. And next thing you know, there was like half a dozen people lined up outside with plates of food. And when the Prophet ﷺ would answer the door and they would hand him the food, they would, you know like, like a waiter just kind of waits for a tip there for an extra second? He said the Prophet ﷺ, they, they would just wait there for a little extra second. And of course the Prophet ﷺ was the most generous human being that ever lived. And he would say, Barakallahu Feek. And they'd be like, woohoo, alright. Ameen, Ameen. And they would leave from there. And he said there was this long line of people that just were there to get du'as from the Prophet ﷺ. So that, I forgot to mention that last time. That's kind of what led to it. So one of the things that we talked about was that the Prophet of Allah wasallam, you know, he on the way from Quba to Medina, he gave the khutbah. And I told you that the narrations of the khutbah are not very, very strong. But um, some of the scholars like Imam At-Tabari rahimahullah ta'ala mentioned some narrations. Um, and he says that they are mursal, that they are not fully connected in terms of their authenticity. But they're not completely erroneous or weak either. But there's just some discussion about the connectivity of the narrations. But he mentions these narrations where he quotes even the khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ. And I just wanted to kind of briefly go through it just so you have a little bit of an idea about what the khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ would sound like. He said, Alhamdulillahi ahmaduhu wa asta'inuhu wa astaghfiruhu wa astahdihi wa uminu bihi wa la akfuruhu wa u'adi man yakfuruhu. He said that the ultimate praise is for Allah. I praise Him, I seek His assistance, I seek forgiveness from Him, I seek guidance from Him, I believe in Allah alone. I am not, I do not disbelieve in Him. And in fact, I am opposed to anyone who disbelieves in God, disbelieves in Allah. Wa ashadu wa la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. I bear witness and give testimony that there is no one worthy of worship except for Allah alone. He has no partners. And the Muhammad is the slave and the messenger of Allah. And so sometimes people ask like, did the Prophet actually say, Ashadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasulu? Yes, he did actually say, because he was teaching us how to say it. But see, the humility of the Prophet still shines through, because before calling himself Nabi or Rasul, he calls himself Abd. Wa anna Muhammadan abduhu. That Muhammad is the slave of Allah. The slave of Allah. Wa Rasuluhu and his messenger. Arsalahu bil huda wa nuri wal maw'idah. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me, has sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with guidance, with the light, the illumination, the nur of revelation, and maw'idah and a sincere counsel for the people. Ala fatratim min al-rusul. After revelation had been paused for a very long time. Wa qillatim min al-ilm. Knowledge had become decreased amongst humanity. Wa dalalatim min al-nas. Misguidance had spread amongst the people. وَإِنْ قِطَاعٍ مِّنَ الزَّمَانِ That the eras and the times had become disconnected. 
The time of the hour, the day of judgment has come very close. The end of the world is very near. Whoever will obey Allah and His Messenger وسلم, has in fact found the correct path, the correct way of, to live life. Whoever will disobey Allah and His Messenger وسلم, that person has lost their way and that person has taken an extreme path. And that person has started living life in a misguided manner. I, I, I appeal to you, I beg you, be conscious of Allah. Inculcate God consciousness into your life. فَإِنَّهُ خَيْرُ مَا أَوْصَى بِهِ الْمُسْلِمُ الْمُسْلِمَ أَنْ يَحُدَّهُ عَلَى الْآخِرَةِ the best thing that a Muslim can ever recommend to another Muslim is to motivate them when it comes to the life of the hereafter. And advise them to stick to God consciousness. So be careful about what Allah has told you to be careful about. There's no better advice than this. There's no better reminder than this. And that this is the taqwa, the God consciousness. وَإِنَّهُ تَقْوَى لِمَنْ عَمِلَ بِهِ عَلَى وَجَلٍ وَمَخَافَةٍ Somebody who will do this and be very mindful and fearful of Allah while doing this, then this is the very essence of taqwa. وَعَوْنُ صِدْقٍ عَلَى مَا تَبْتَهُونَ مِنْ أَمْرِ الْآخِرَةِ And this will help that person be able to seek out what they seek out from the life of the hereafter. وَمَنْ يُسْلِحِ الَّذِي بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ مِنْ أَمْرِ سِرِّ وَالْعَنَانِيَ لَا يَنْوِي بِذَلِكَ إِلَّا وَجْهَ اللَّهِ يَكُنْ لَهُ ذِكْرًا فِي عَاجِلِ أَمْرِهِ وَذُخْرًا فِي مَعْبَعَدَ الْمَوْتِ That somebody who will correct things between them and Allah. Somebody who will correct things between them and Allah, their relationship with Allah, whether it be in private or it be in public. That they correct things between them and Allah. And they don't want anything but the pleasure of Allah. They only do this to please Allah. This will remind that person and keep that person on track when it comes to fulfilling their task at hand. And this will be an investment for them for what lies after death. حِينَ يَفْتَقِرُ الْمَرْءُ إِلَى مَا قَدَّمَ And that time after death is when a person will desperately need everything that they have invested into the hereafter. Like a person will need that investment on that day. وَمَا كَانَ مِنْ سِوَى ذَلِكَ يَوَدُّ لَوْ أَنَّ بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَهُ أَمَدًا بَعِيدًا Everything else, material things, a person will not want anything to do with those things on the day of judgment. وَيُحَذِّرُكُمُ اللَّهُ نَفْسَهُ Allah warns you. Allah warns you about Himself. That while Allah is merciful, you will also have to answer to Allah. وَاللَّهُ رَأُوفٌ بِالْعِبَادِ But Allah is always compassionate with His slaves. وَالَّذِي صَدَقَ قَوْلُهُ وَأَنْجَزَ وَعَدَهُ وَلَا خُلْفَ لِذَلِكَ That Allah who always speaks the truth and His promise is always fulfilled and He never violates or breaks His promise. فَإِنَّهُ يَقُولُ تَعَالَى He has said, مَا يُبَدَّلُ الْقَوْلُ لَدَيَّ وَمَا أَنَا بِظَلَّامِ لِلْعَبِيدِ That my word will never change, my promise will never change. وَمَا أَنَا بِظَلَّامِ لِلْعَبِيدِ And I will never do wrong to my slaves. وَاتَّقُ اللَّهَ فِي عَاجِلِ أَمْرِكُمْ وَآجِلِهِ Be conscious of God in the short term and in the long term. فِي السِّرِّ وَالْعَلَانِيَةِ In private and in public. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يُكَفِّرْ عَنْهُ سَيِّئَاتِهِ وَيُعْضِمْ لَهُ أَجْرًا Whoever will live a life of God consciousness, Allah will not only forgive the sins of that person, remove the sins of that person, but Allah will increase the reward of that person. Whoever lives a life of God consciousness, that person has attained the greatest success possible for any human being. That being conscious of Allah will protect you from the anger of Allah. عُقُوبَتَهُ Will protect you from the punishment of Allah. سَخَطَهُ Will protect you from the displeasure of Allah. وَإِنَّ تَقْوَى اللَّهِ تُبَيِّدُ الْوَجْهَ 
وَتُرْضِي الرَّبَّ وَتَرْفَعُ الدَّرَجَةَ That the God consciousness, living a life where you are always thinking of Allah, will bring you honor on the day of judgment, will please your Lord, and will elevate your status in the eyes of God. خُذُوا بِحَذِّكُمْ So take this in full. Like, like we try to, like خُذُوا بِحَذِّكُمْ is like an expression in Arabic that means, so go out and get what's yours. Go out and get yours. So go out and earn this, work for this, get it, earn it, work for it. وَلَا تُفَرِّدُوا فِي جَنْبِ اللَّهِ And do not be negligent when it comes to your relationship with Allah. You know how we're diligent about everything? School, career, job. Don't be negligent when it comes to your relationship with Allah. قَدْ عَلَّمَكُمُ اللَّهُ كِتَابَهُ Allah taught you His book. وَنَهَجَ لَكُمْ سَبِيلَهُ He taught you how to live on His path. لِيَعْلَمَ الَّذِينَ صَدَقُوا وَلِيَعْلَمَ الْكَاذِبِينَ So that Allah will know fully well who are the people that are truthful in their faith and who are the people who are lying through their teeth. فَأَحْسِنُوا كَمَا أَحْسَنَ اللَّهُ إِلَيْكُمْ So practice excellence with your Lord, how your Lord has granted you the most excellent of everything. وَعَادُوا أَعْدَاءَهُ And somebody who opposes Allah is your automatic opposition as well. وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ and strive in the path of God to the best of your ability. He chose you and named you, called you Muslims. So that somebody who perishes, perishes, you know, with the understanding of what was right. So somebody who dies and leaves this world knows what they live their life for, and somebody who continues to live life knows exactly what they're living life for. There's no ability to do good and no strength to resist evil except through the mercy of Allah. So the take home points, make the dhikr of Allah as much as you can. The way, one of the ways to develop taqwa, now the Prophet gives the action points. How do you develop taqwa? Number one, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as much as you can. وَعَمَلُوا لِمَا بَعْدَ الْمَوْتِ Always prioritize your akhirah over your dunya. فَإِنَّهُ مَنْ أَصْلَحَ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ يَكْفِهِ مَا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ النَّاسِ Somebody who can correct things, the, the relationship between him and Allah, or her and Allah, then Allah will take care of that person's relationship with the people. Somebody who corrects that which is between them and Allah, Allah will correct that which is between them and the people. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ يَقْضِي عَلَى النَّاسِ وَلَا يَقْضُونَ عَلَيْهِ Because Allah is in control of the people and they are not in control of Allah. Allah is the one who decrees the fate of mankind and they don't make any decision upon Allah. وَيَمْلِكُوا مِنَ النَّاسِ وَلَا يَمْلِكُونَ مِنْهُ He owns the people, they don't own Him. He controls the people, they don't control him. Allahu Akbar. وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِاللَّهِ الْعَلِيِّ الْعَظِيمِ And Allah is greater than everything and anything. And there's no strength to do any of this, except through Allah, who is the most elevated, and the most mighty and powerful and great. So this was the khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ. This was the inaugural khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ in Al-Madinah Al-Munawwara. So he gives this exact khutbah, and then he proceeds on forward. And as we talked about in the previous uh, session, he takes up residence in the ho home of Abu Ayyub al-Ansari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, temporarily, uh, about six to seven months is what some of the more popular narrations of the seerah mention. They designate the land where the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ will be built. And inshallah in the next session, we'll talk about the actual construction of the masjid. And we will also begin to talk about the survey of al Madinah al Munawwara. This is something the Prophet ﷺ did. He surveyed Medina. What is the economic situation in Medina? What is the tribal circumstance in Medina? What is the geographical layout of Medina? What is the political climate? in Medina. What is the social circumstances and what is the culture in Medina? He surveyed a lot of these things to be able to um, execute a plan that would actually work with these people. To have a proper strategy on how to engage the people of Medina. And so we'll talk about some of those surveys of Medina and what exactly was, uh, you know, what was, what was Medina at that time. 
What was Medina like at that particular time? We'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the construction of Al-Masjid al-Nabawi al-Sharif. And then we'll talk about the construction of the apartments, the hujurat, where the Prophet ﷺ would reside with his family. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. If I, if I can mention a word here, I'll just share something with everyone. You know, we just went through the inaugural khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ in al Madinatun Munawwara. And we see what that khutbah was like, what it focused on, and how, you know, it, it really touched at the core of the issue. And connected everyone to the Book of Allah, connected everyone to Allah. Really put life in perspective. Had the tangible, practical action items at the very end. Was motivational, was inspirational. But at the same time, talking about the circumstances of the people. This is the khutbah of the Prophet ﷺ. You know, and I will use this as an opportunity to just kind of have a little bit of a tangent, a little bit of a tirade, if, even if you will, um, that about the circumstances or about the present condition of the khutbatul jumu'ah in the Muslim community today. It is the most powerful, the most united, unified, the most powerful, the most unified, organized, you know, forum and platform that we have in the Muslim community today. I mean, it is something that is divinely instituted. Divinely. Right? We talk about successful programming, not successful programming. It, this, is, this is instituted by Allah. This is divine design. Who came up with the program? Allah did. Who fixed the time and the place of the program? Allah did. Who came up with the structure and the curriculum of, of the program? Allah did. فَسْعَوْ إِلَىٰ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ And so it's such a powerful thing. Who first exemplified and executed this program? Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And even when you study the fiqh of khutbah and jumu'ah, you realize that it is mandatory to attend, and it is mandatory that when you attend, you sit and you listen and you pay attention. So it doesn't get much more, you know, it, it, there's no opportunity better than this. But an opportunity for what is the question though? An opportunity to, uh, you know, carry out whatever type of political dynamic or polemics there are in the community? That we carry out the politics of the community on the mimbar? or to carry out the different ideolo ideological warfare within the community on the mimbar. But it's an opportunity to inspire, to motivate, to engage. That's what, the, that's what it's a platform for. That's what it's an opportunity for. And we have so much talk a lot of times, you know, this is a Tuesday evening. So for those who listen to the session later on, it's Tuesday evening at the Irving, Islamic Center of Irving, Irving Masjid. So those folks that are here an hour after Salat al-Isha on a Tuesday night, you know, mashallah, these are people that are here on a weekday night for an hour listening to Darsh on the Seerah. A little bit more involved and engaged. So I will say this, we talk a lot about, you know, people who only come on Friday. But what we need to actually understand is that what an opportunity that is. And at least they're there on the Friday. And if that, that Friday was done, was executed properly, who know where that could lead people? And what that could actually lead to. So it's a really powerful opportunity, it's a really powerful platform, and a, and a forum that Allah has granted us. That the Prophet ﷺ implemented, and practiced, that we really haven't taken full advantage of. And something that we need to take seriously. And we need to, we need to really be concerned. You know, mashallah, masajid like this, communities like this, are very blessed. Where the Jum'ah khutbah here is beneficial, it's informed, it's knowledgeable, it's inspirational, motivational for the community. But I will tell you one thing, that this is the exception, not the rule. It's, it, this is not the norm right now in the Muslim community, unfortunately, very tragically. And so we have to kind of get that back on track. And so just for everyone's information here, and also those who might be on, listening online, you know, one of the things that our teachers, our shuyukh, our mashayikh, our scholars, one of the things that they implemented within us, when we were studying, was to teach us how to properly give the Friday khutbah. 
and how to make the most of this opportunity, how to fulfill the right of that khutbah and that mimbar. They used to tell us that every single mimbar all throughout the world is an extension of the mimbar of the Prophet ﷺ. They taught us not only to respect it, but to utilize it for what the Prophet ﷺ utilized it for. And they instilled that within us, and part of our efforts when coming back and working within our communities was to help others be able to, again, you know, fulfill the right of the mimbar and the Friday khutbah. And so maybe about five, six years ago, we kind of organized our efforts and created a forum, created a program where annually we would train khatibs. And we would talk, we would teach them, we would train them, and we would try to help them to the best of our ability, not only to know what to do, but how to go about in doing so and have the confidence and the ability to be able to conduct the Friday khutbah properly. Again, like I said, major masajid like this have the luxury of scholars and imma, imams and scholars who have the knowledge and have the know-how and have the experience with the people like Imam Ziya who are able to communicate to the community and inspire and motivate, move the community. But there are so many other places, whether they be smaller communities or masajid or musallas or the, the university MSA khutbah or the khutbah at the workplace or at the hospital. Where people are there for that same spiritual food. And it's the only 10, 15, 20 minutes of spiritual food that they get every single week. And so, it's very important that we get that on track. And that we're able to use this for the sake of the ummah, to motivate and to inspire. So alhamdulillah, we conduct this program every single year and, and we, we try to reach out to the community as much as possible that people come, take the benefit, are able to learn what to do properly and take that, that benefit back to their communities, back to their congregations. And become a force of khayr and a force of good within their congregations and their communities. So inshallah it's actually this weekend. So maybe somebody from here is able to attend, maybe they're not able to attend. I still wanted to share that with everyone. So that you yourself understand what the Friday khutbah is for. And if you are in a position, you have the capacity to actually help your congregation. Then you do so, but you do so with the proper knowledge and the understanding and the training necessary to be a force of good. And to be able to bring benefit to the people. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all the ability to practice everything that was said and heard. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanakallah wa bihamdik, nashadu wa la ilaha illa anta, nasaghfirku wa natubu ilayk.